Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome everybody to the first episode of Long Box Carpentry. This is going to be the first of a special series of episodes spinning off from the main series, Masters of Carpentry, where we're finally going to be looking at all of the various comic book tie-ins related to films made by John Carpenter. And for this special series, I am going to be joined by an amazing guest. Everybody, please welcome J.D. DeMott. Hey, thanks, Noel. Uh, pleasure to be here. Why don't you uh, let everyone know who you are, where they can find you? I am JD. I do a show on YouTube called Comics Are Awesome. I also do a show called From the Pages. Comics Are Awesome. I talk about awesome comics. It's pretty simple. <laughs> um, and From the Pages, I review comic-inspired film or TV. And you can find me at JD Demott on Twitter. I should mention to our listeners that some of you probably remember like a year ago, I did post a kind of solo review of the first volume that we're going to be discussing tonight. Consider this a replacement, because that was fun to do, but, I don't know, the solo talking to a microphone solo reviews, just, eh, I didn't have fun with that. It's good to have friends. It is. I mean, I, I am your friend, right? Would I have had you here if you weren't? <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be fun. I'm not familiar with a lot of these comics, so it'll be new for me, but I think it'll be a lot of fun to discuss these. It's not surprising which John Carpenter properties are returning to comics, but it's kind of surprising sometimes how many of them are out there. You gave me a list, and I'm kind of in awe. And I should mention to our listeners that there are currently three comic book series that are running. There's Asylum, which is an original comic that John created. There's The Big Trouble in Little China Escape for New York comics. We are not covering those comics as part of this miniseries yet. Those are things that we're just kind of going to keep on the back burner until the main Masters of Carpentry podcast has come to a close, and I think that'll be a fun follow-up project. And yes, J.D., you are invited to join us for those. Awesome. So the first question I have for you, J.D., since we haven't had you on the main podcast yet, what is your opinion of John Carpenter in general? I have mainly only seen like the Billy Big hits of him. A lot of the ones that you've discussed, like the little films that he's done. You mean you haven't seen Zuma Beach? I, I know. I'm shocked, too. <laughs> I kind of want to after you guys talked about it, but... Most of the ones I've seen are the ones we're going to be discussing here in these comic reviews, so that works out well for me. I want to say The Thing is actually the first one I may have seen. I didn't see it until I was an adult. I think I saw it right after I got Netflix. It was one of those films I've always wanted to see. I had played the video game of The Thing, but I had never seen the movie until after that. But I watched it and I fell in love with it. It's one of my favorite horror films of all time. It holds up remarkably well. And after that, I kind of went through a little bit of a periodic carpenter dipping my toe in. I've seen They Live, Big Trouble in Little China, Halloween. It was actually one of the last of the films I saw. But everything I've seen is usually is pretty solid. I mean, there are ones that hold up better than others. And I've not seen some of the things like The Fog or whatever that he's probably also known for. I consider myself at least a casual fan. But the ones I have seen made a really strong impression with me. Like I said, a lot of the ones that I have seen are the ones we're going to be covering in these comics. I'm glad you enjoyed The Thing so much, since our first subject is The Thing. What a coincidence! Or at least The Thing from Another World. And we should probably just uh, right off the bat discuss the fact that they're called Thing from Another World, not The Thing. And that's entirely because when they started promoting the first miniseries, Marvel sent them a cease and desist. <laughs> Because they are the publishers of The Thing. The ever-loving blue-eyed thing. Yeah. Oh, man. Is that what I was supposed to read? Um, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to get my mind off of Yancey Street. You mean you did not read all 152 issues of Marvel 2 and 1 in front of this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not read that. Um, yeah, we're here to discuss The Thing from Another World from Dark Horse Comics. Which, it's good that they had that backup title from 1951 to fall back on. Mm -hmm. But yes, Dark Horse Comics. J.D., are you familiar with Dark Horse Comics? I don't think you can be a comic reader for very long without being at least a little bit familiar with it. I don't typically read a lot of Dark Horse, mainly because by the time I got into comics in the 90s, what they were probably most well known for was their adaptations of other media like Star Wars and Aliens and Predator and The Thing. 
They've done a lot of other things as well. The mask, barbed wire. You're just rolling through all my notes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, it's one of the things where I'm not super interested in reading fan fiction, <laughs> to put it bluntly, which sometimes those type of stories that are set after or before typically are. It doesn't mean I'm against it per se. It's just not what I'm naturally inclined to check out. So that's why I'm having you join me for the tie-in books. <laughs> Hey, I mean, it doesn't mean that I don't have an interest in it. It just means that it's like I said, it's just if you were to give me an issue of The Mask versus an issue of Aliens versus Predator, I'd probably be more inclined to check out The Mask because that was original. But it doesn't mean I'm not interested in checking out the other stuff. It's just that it's not where I go to first. Funnily enough, our second book is by the co-creator of The Mask. (laughs) Yeah, I had a note about that too. (laughs) Which was itself a reboot of something from the earlier 80s. (laughs) (laughs) True. Yeah, no, and it's just I support remakes, I support sequels, I support reboots. And I've always been a fan of tie-in media. I'm I'm always a fan of seeing what people will do with something that's already pre-existing. I often find that a lot of original works are just as derivative of stuff that already exists anyways, that it doesn't really make much of a difference to me. And I know that, yeah, Dark Horse, I definitely read a lot of their Alien and Predator books. I have yet to dig through all their Star Wars books. And yeah, I mean, Dark Horse, ever since 1988, when they debuted the Aliens, they were kind of known for higher quality tie-in books. Because tie-in comics, you know, we've gone back since the beginning of comic books. Mm -hmm. Even at that point, Topps was doing a lot of tie-ins. Marvel had a lot of tie-ins. Dark Horse was always known for just kind of taking it another level in terms of, because they were very miniseries focused, They tried to structure each one like each one could be its own movie. Each one kind of had the same story length of a movie, or you just had these great little one shots, as opposed to just trying to stretch things out to an ongoing, ever running series. You know, like a lot of other previous tie ins have been like, you know, Transformers and G.I. Joe and Star Wars and stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they definitely had a lot of success with Aliens and Predator and Godzilla and Terminator, Indiana Jones and. This is kind of one of the oddities of one of the ones that they tried to get going, and as we'll cover over the next two episodes, their thing ran for like four separate series, and yet it never fully took off. It just kind of went for a couple of years and then just disappeared again. Without having read the last two chapters, what we'll be covering in our next episode, I will say there might be reasons for that. Yeah, that's something we've discussed in past episodes, is the thing can be a little bit of a limiting concept, but we'll get there. Right. Let me just get a little bit into the history of who's involved in this particular one, because this first one, which debuted in 1991, I I haven't been able to find like a specific date on when these issues were, just they were both in 1991. They don't list the month. The script for this first series, again, just called Thing from Another World, though if you look at the copyright page, it's the thing, parentheses, from another world. (laughs) The script was written by Chuck Ferrer, who's an unusual choice as this is one of only two comic book titles he's ever written. Chuck actually got his start as a Navy SEAL, and when he retired from duty, he decided to become a screenwriter. And JD, can you guess what the first script he wrote was called? Ooh, Navy SEALs. He wrote Navy SEALs. And he'd go on to be a writer for Dark Man, Hard Target, Point of Impact, Second Nature, Arlington Road, The Jackal, and Red Planet, as well as the video games Flash Traffic and Silent Steel. And after doing this project for Dark Horse, he continued working there a little bit longer. He did the screenplay for their film adaptation of Barb Wire, the Pamela Anderson version, Uh. and also brought them Virus. Now, Virus is what started a trend that we see nowadays where he had a screenplay that he wasn't able to sell, so he sold it to Dark Horse to be adapted as a four-issue miniseries in the hopes that it would then sell as a movie, which it then did. Yep, starring Jamie Lee Curtis. And the movie was produced by Dark Horse Studios, and they threw him out and brought in new writers to completely rewrite it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've not read or seen Virus. Oh, I have. <laughs> but it, everything I've heard is that it A, is not that great, and B, the two don't really resemble each other much at all. Yeah, the comic and the movie are, are very different entities entirely. It's like comparing the 1951 thing from Another World to the John Carpenter the thing. They're just similar idea, run off in two different directions. Mm. I actually don't hate the Virus movie. It's fine. And what's funny is they brought in the guy who wrote Species, who also wrote a number of comics for Dark Horse. (laughs) And Chuck Ferrer is, because I'm a collector of screenplays, I've encountered him a number of times because I've not only seen, but I've also read Hard Target, Red Planet, and The Jackal. And I'm not a big fan of Chuck Ferrer's writing style for reasons that are apparent in this story and we will discuss later. Yeah. 
And I should point out that he has since retired from screenwriting, thankfully, and has started writing non-fiction books like Warrior's Soul, The Memoir of a Navy Seal, Killing Shay, and Seal Target Geronimo, The Inside Story of the Mission to Kill Osama Bin Laden. That's interesting. I don't know what to, how to respond to that. I, I did come across his website, and it showed him probably in his 60s in his uniform. But uh, yeah, he seems like an interesting guy. His writing style does leave me a little wanting, but we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. And I should mention, on his site, he says that he wrote all four of the Thing series. He did not. He only worked on this first one. Interesting. I wonder if he maybe had some input into like where the plot was supposed to be going and he took that as I'm writing it. Could be. And we'll be getting into it, but it does leave itself open. Yeah, there are a few carryovers. Yeah. But yeah, because it's clearly not him writing or even the same style. I mean, you could just block off the credit page and it would read completely different as far as the two stories that we're covering today. And again, it'll be interesting to see if there is any carryover of some of those plot threads into the third and fourth. I should point out, these first two that we are covering here tonight, the first two miniseries, I have read those before. I've actually owned them since the mid-90s because both of them were collected into a single trade. I have never read the third and fourth ones before. So when we get to those in the next episode, that'll be me finally hitting some new territory. I'll be interested to see where it goes. Yeah. So, and then the art was done by a painter named John Higgins from the UK, who got to start doing various stories for 2080, most prominently Future Shocks with Alan Moore and a noted run on Judge Dredd. Since The Thing, his interior art has become more sporadic on works like World Without End, Razor Jack, Gray Suit, and A Brief Run on Hellblazer. And I actually found an interview with him where he said that it was doing The Thing made him realize that he can't really sustain that quality of work on a monthly, so he kind of stopped doing them for the most part. Mm. But he became noted throughout the 90s for doing a lot of fantasy novel cover paintings. He continued doing covers. Like, he did all the covers not only for this first series, but the second series we're going to discuss later. Mm -hmm. And did tons of covers for 2000 AD did I want to see a good third of the Swamp Thing run. And he's also a noted colorist, and he was the colorist of Watchmen and the Killing Joke. Right, right. That Watchmen connection then led him to be the writer and artist on the Curse of the Crimson Corsair backup feature, which ran through all of the before Watchmen books. That was one of the things I, I do remember from that series. Usually the only thing I can really recommend is the Darwin Cook issues that he did mm. with the Minutemen and Silk Spectre. But the art in the Corsair story was really good. The story itself, to be honest, I kind of lost the thread of it and I stopped following it after a while. Yeah, before Watchmen's one of the ones, I like picked up a bunch of the first issues and then I just can't remember what happened, but I never followed up on them. I need to sit down and read through that. I just kind of stopped reading and that because the Corsair story was interwoven between all of it. So it became hard to follow because I think I just stopped reading some of it because some of it was just really bad. When I know Len Wein started as the writer of that and then at some point Wein just left and Higgins just wrote it as well as drew it. Interesting. Before Watchmen is an entire thing that I need to sit down and read. Again, 2000 AD is like an entire like museum of comics that I have yet to explore. There's so much. Pretty much any UK writer or artist that you probably know probably oh, yeah. came from doing something on AD first. And he did Judge Dredd for several years. So he had quite a prominent run over there. And he's a really good artist, too. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how great a storyteller he is from a layout perspective, but individual panels in this story, I would mind having them on my wall. I mean, they're works of art. Oh, definitely. And it's all hand-painted. Yeah. The colors on it are fantastic. I mean, you could tell it's from somebody who understands color really well because some of it, like before JJ ruined lens flares for everyone, there are actual lens flares painted into the story. It looks fantastic. It doesn't look cheesy at all. I love how it's like cold blues and whites and then a thing appears and it's suddenly just bursting red. Right. And like when he does the blood test, it's bright red and orange and it's just kind oh, of yeah. a glow and it does a good job of it. It doesn't look like the movie, but it does a great job of setting a mood akin to the movie is the best way I can put it. Well, let, let's just run through the synopsis here real quick. Okay. And then we'll definitely pick up that conversation because I have so many things to say about his art. Shortly after the events of the first film, McCready comes to on a hospital bed aboard a Japanese whaling vessel. It seems Childs dragged him to the shore of Antarctica, flagged the ship down, then returned inland. After Mac freaks out about how everyone's going to die, he's sedated and comes to in restraints. Freeing himself, he desperately tests his own blood and finds he's still clean. He steals the ship's helicopter and flies back to the remains of the base, crashing the chopper along the way. Digging through the rubble, he finds the remains of monsters and men alike and starts burning it all to ash. 
As he gets to the last creature, a Navy SEAL team led by a man named Erskine suddenly drops in. Gee, I'm surprised that Navy SEALs are here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Chuck Fair, he knows his niche. So Erskine suddenly drops in, having been activated once communication with the camp was lost. Mac desperately tries to fill them in, but that lands him in cuffs, and when he kicks away a soldier examining the remains, he's knocked out with a rifle butt to the head. He comes to just as a chopper is landing, and the sudden rush of wind exposes the mutating face of one of the men. The thing opens up with the machine gun in its hands, taking out men left and right, and violently downing the chopper before Mac and Erskine are able to kill it. Taking stock of their situation, Mac wants them all to just freeze there and die, but Erskine, at gunpoint, forces Mac to take up one of two injured men on sleds and help march them to the nearest camp. Along the way, one of the injured men dies. The next day, they find themselves lost, and Erskine attacks Mac for knowingly allowing them to stray down the wrong path. They're suddenly surrounded by Spanish-speaking men, as well as a face familiar to Mac, that of Childs. In issue two, Mac attacks Childs only to be knocked out and cuffed by Erskine. They're all led back to the nearby Argentinian camp, a large community populated by dozens of people. Coming to, Mac again freaks, but Childs has filled the camp in on the situation, and nobody is allowed in without first going through the blood test. Childs and Mac are clean. Before its blood can be checked, the injured seal on the sled bursts into a thing and violently escapes, the others hunting it down and blowing it up in an ice cave. Returning to the camp and resting, Mac suddenly remembers that, amidst the chaos, Erskine was never tested. Sure enough, everybody in the radio room is slaughtered with a communique hailing down an American sub having gone through. Mac and Childs hop on a snowmobile and chase Erskine down, but just as they open fire on him, the ice bursts open and the sub emerges. The thing sheds Erskine's form and tears onto the sub, ripping through the crew as Mac and Childs follow it on board. The hatch is never fully sealed as the sub quickly crashes into an undersea mountain, leaving it crippled and quickly bleeding air. Filling in the crew, Mac and Childs hatch a plan to reach the escape hatch on the other end of the sub, but everyone is, of course, attacked by the thing. Childs decides enough is enough and just blows the final hatch to kill everyone on board, and it ends up rupturing the hull. McCrady floats back to the surface where he pulls himself onto a tiny iceberg and goes to sleep as he begins freezing to death. So, J.D., do you recommend this first volume of Thing from Another World? No, but there's a lot of things to appreciate here. This story does a really good job of imitating the original in tone, but it feels like it doesn't really add anything new or comment on the original. And it feels like it loses a little bit of something. As much as I appreciate the art, it feels like a weak copy of the original. And I know that's kind of ironic considering the subject matter, but... It's an infected copy. Yeah. The claustrophobia was so key to so much of the tension in Carpenter's film. And it doesn't ever quite feel like you ever get that sense of foreboding or dwelling on anything for very long. It's, you know, he wakes up on the boat and then he goes out to the camp and then this and this and this and, and this. And then this happens. And then this happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it never gives any chance to linger and just build up that tension. And admittedly, it's hard to do that in a comic, especially when you only have two issues to tell your story. And so I really don't want to be too harsh on it. And there are also some plot points that I can really kind of nitpick and that really don't make sense to me. But I mean, if you're a big Thing fan, I could see this is something that you might want to check out at some point. I wouldn't say rush out and read it. It'll kind of be like getting like a Diet Coke when you wanted a Coke instead. It'll kind of serve, but it's no notch on the original. It's like Crystal Pepsi. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, some people like Crystal Pepsi. I know. I used to. At the point that we're recording this, that's supposed to be coming back soon. So I'm really curious. We'll see. <laughs> but I don't know if it's any good anymore. Yeah. And I, I also don't recommend the Thing series. I think, yeah, there's some good ideas here. I love the art for the most part, but I even have problems with the art. Yeah. Mostly just though on a scripting level, it's just so rushed and it keeps jumping from thing to thing to thing and there's no suspense at all. Mm -mm. There's no tension and there's no character to any of it. Nope. Aside from Mac and Childs, can you name a character? The only one that I can name is Erskine, and that's because they kept saying his name, and it's similar enough to Dr. Erskine, who was the doctor who made Captain America. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm a kind of a nerd that way. I don't know if that was a shout out or if that's just a name. And other than Erskine? Uh, no. I have no clue. And did you ever see Erskine's face? No, and that was the problem, is I had trouble, like, early on when one of them's about to touch the body of the thing that Mac was about to torch. One of them touches it, and I don't know which one did. And I still don't, really. I mean, I can kind of guess, but it's never made clear. And that, I think, is the main problem, is that this feels underdeveloped. 
It feels like they have the basic backbones for where they want the story to go, but they never took the time to flesh it out. Mm -hmm. It feels like you're reading an outline. Yeah. And there's moments like when they're going to like get on the chopper and I think it was the seal who touched the body just explodes and becomes a thing for no particular reason. That's completely against the whole, they're supposed to remain in hiding. Exactly. I'm trying to think, did like the wind of the chopper blow something off of his face and reveal the tentacles underneath? Or no, he's just standing there with tentacles. It made no sense to me. I had just rewatched the movie earlier this week, and they say, like, it wants to be left alone. There's even the scene in the movie where they find the thing replacing someone, and it's just kind of a icky, very prolonged process. Right. It's not a body exploding into tentacles and spiky bits. And that's the other thing is, yeah, the thing always explodes fully formed in this comic, too. Mm -hmm. Instead of, like, in the movie, it's a process. It has to gradually build itself up. Yeah, it seems like it, considering, I don't know how long it would have taken them to get from the base to the chopper or whatever, but it seemed like that person was converted really fast when in the movie it seemed like it was a slow process and they kind of went a little loopy or they were just away from everybody else whenever the change happened so that way they could kind of come in seamlessly. Even with the guy on the sled who suddenly burst into one too, not only was there no indication that he was being turned, but it's like just suddenly a fully formed thing rips out. Yeah, it really didn't make any sense to me. And the only thing I can think of is that they felt they needed an action beat. They needed something to quote unquote scare us, even though because the way it's done, it's not really scary, but they needed something. And I think that's one of the problems I'm going to have with the thing comics in general. I don't want to spoil the next story too much, but it seems like the problem is that because the comics are monthly and therefore you always have to kind of cliffhanger, you yeah. have to have a cliffhanger, you have to build up. And you, if you had a whole issue of just build up in tension, they may not come back for the second issue because there was no payoff. But for this type of story, I think it almost needs to be like a graphic novel, like a solid big book where you can tell your story and pace towards that instead of towards a monthly issue. Though to be fair, you know, the original Carpenter film, you can kind of beat it out like every 20 minutes as to how often a thing thing would happen. That is true. Starting with the dog which is the end of the first act. But because the film could take time and have five minutes to build up that scene, it felt like a release. And here, it just happens. I think the only thing that there's a little bit of tension is any time you have to test Max blood, because they'll focus in on Max's face as even he's like, is it going to be positive? Is it going to be positive? Yeah, and the scene where he wakes up on the ship, they did take a little bit of time, just kind of like establish him as being like tied up and, you know. And they built that doctor as a character and then you never see her again. <laughs> right, right. I was kind of surprised when I realized that she never comes back. Yeah, it just seems to be kind of the whole thing. It's, that's why I wondered if Ferrer had maybe blocked out some of the future stories lines because this one just seems like the first chapter of something because the ending of it it doesn't seem like an ending it feels like it's trying to invoke the film's ending but it doesn't do anything to make me feel like it deserved that it's like okay we killed the thing and now he's gonna die again on nice right back where he started yeah that's why I said in my recommendation, like, it doesn't have anything to add or to say about the original. It just yeah. kind of was like the continuing story, and then we were going to stop real soon, and then we'll leave you more or less where you were at. It feels like he set up six different set pieces that you could build a plot around, and then just strung them all together into a story instead of actually building a plot. Like, okay, Mac gets onto a Japanese, it's either an oil or a whaling vessel, you can build a story around that ship and its crew. Mm -hmm. But we don't. So he goes back to the old base, starts burning everything when a Navy SEAL team comes in. You could build a story around that, but they don't. Then they get to the Argentinian base where it's suddenly a massive base with dozens of people that has a security procedure set up and blood testing. You could build a story around that, but they don't. You know, the whole chasing this thing through the ice in a new ice cave. You could build a story around that, but they don't. And then the biggest disappointment is the submarine, which shows up and within four pages is blowing up. You could have an entire story set on a submarine about the thing. Oh, yeah. And they don't. And it's like you have like five or six great set pieces that you could build a plot on, but instead of focusing on just one of them, he throws them all into the same mix and doesn't focus on any of them. Yeah. I was going to say, like, I think part of his problem is that, like, I've seen a lot of Hollywood types come in and write for comics, and usually it doesn't feel as well paced or something's usually a little off whenever somebody comes from Hollywood because it's a different format and it's a new medium. Yeah. And I totally understand it. And there's usually learning curves for anyone. And he probably used to writing like 120 pages for a script in a movie, and he gets maybe half that for two issues. And that's what surprised me is that it's two issues. Yeah. 
I mean, admittedly, like in the early 2000s, six issues kind of became the standard for a storyline or miniseries. Oh, yeah. I mean, like at this point, even at Dark Horse, the four issue minis. Right. I was going to say. Because again, that's about the length of a film. If you put that story up on a screen, Mm -hmm. we'll get some more in that in the second miniseries. But I mean, this one that it's not only two issues, but it's two extra length issues. So it's like two 30 page issues, which is about the equivalent of three issues. It's just a lot of weird math in this one. Yeah. I kind of wonder if this was just like, maybe he had started writing a script and then he didn't have time to like really flesh it out. Like maybe he had intended to pitch this as an actual film and nobody either was biting or wasn't interested. He gave it to Dark Horse. I think he was already there in talks for Virus. So it might just be that they already had the property and were like, hey, you want to do something with this? That's possible. I don't know. It's it, There's a good story in there somewhere. But we didn't find it. <laughs> but it either needed more space to flesh it out, or you needed to cut out half of what they did have and let it linger a little bit more. Let the better parts you know, rise to the surface and cut out the chaff. Because it was there's a lot of stuff that are really good ideas, or at least could be fleshed out to make good ideas, but not enough to really make it this worth recommending. And I mean, like, McCready, this is where we see him just kind of turn into the paranoid guy running around telling everyone they're going to die. Yeah. There's nothing really about the way the Childs is written that feels like the Childs of the movie. He's just someone for Mac to banter with. And I have a question, and maybe, I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but does Dark Horse, do they not normally get the actor's likeness rights, or... Sometimes that comes with, sometimes they don't. Because, I mean, it was a passable Mac, but Childs looks nothing like Keith David. Part of that is also John Hagen's art styles. He just does everyone kind of smooth. Yeah, he is. his art is a little... It's not photorealistic, despite being very painted. You have to remember in Judge Dredd, everyone's wearing a helmet when he drew it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, everybody's wearing a helmet in this one except for Mac and Child, so... Yeah, and Child's is just kind of a generic bald black guy. Right. And Mac is just a generic guy with a beard. Right. I mean, I think the beard does kind of resemble Kurt Russell, but it's generic enough that you could say, well, you could tell that's what they're going for, but it's, if you hadn't told me it was Child's, I wouldn't have known. This was still a couple years before, but I know that in the late 80s, early 90s, actors' likenesses being something that you specifically had to have in the contract kind of became an issue because you had that whole crisping glove suing the Back to the Future sequels Mm -hmm. for having a person made up to look like Crispin Glover. And then I know Alien 3 ran into that with just having that one photo of Michael Bean where they ended up having to pay him a full acting salary for it. Yeah, he ended up, I think, making more money on Alien 3 than he did on Aliens. And I know that the likeness issue became a thing. And I know that that wasn't a huge problem with most of the Alien and Predator books because they were just new characters. They were new characters and new storylines. But even then when they did Terminator, they just drew a generic big muscular guy. They didn't specifically draw Arnie. Right. I know the first couple Alien miniseries had Ripley, Newton, Hicks in them, but they kind of just drew them in a generic fashion. So I'm not sure if they just didn't specifically have those licenses. I don't know. Because I don't think anywhere in any of the things series that I've seen, McCready particularly looks like Kurt Russell. He's just kind of action beard guy. Right. Wiley McBeard action guy. Just a weird aside as far as like Kurt Russell. There is one panel where he wakes up in the hospital and he's strapped down with like a robe that covers his chest. But the way it's angled, his pectorials look like he has breasts. It's just odd. Maybe I'm the only one who's thought that. I'm sorry. It's early on. It's just one of the first things I noticed. I was like, does Kurt Russell have breasts here? Oh, I'm looking at it now. Yes. Yeah. And the way they have the strap covering the nipples, it looks like he has cleavage. Yeah, yeah. It's just the angle is a little weird. I mean, it's fine, but it was a random aside as far as like the appearance. It's, it's, the art is good, but it's, it's. I agree with everything you said earlier of I love the coloring. I think some of the paintings are beautiful. The layouts are fine. They don't have an exciting story to tell. My main problem is that whenever it comes to depicting a person, Everyone just looks kind of like a smooth plastic action figure. Mm -hmm. And there's no personality to them and the expression is just kind of forced. There's very little expression. Most of it's just Mac looking crazy. Right. And again, Erskine is the only other major character of the story. And he's always got a helmet on. Yeah. We never see him. We never learn a thing about him. He's just kind of in opposition to Mac until he turns out to be a thing. I do love moments, like I love the moment where they shoot Erskine and he's just standing there clutching at his bloody head. 
and then erupts into a thing. Yeah. I kind of like that in this story, bullets can affect the thing. They can't kill the thing, but they can mess with it because you'd think that the thing would have to form a brain in order to think things through, and you can upset that process temporarily. You're still splattering all over the place, but still. Well, it, it might be like it's weakening him just as much as like, even if your internal organs can be rearranged on a whim, it still takes a yeah. moment to like redo that. And if it wants to speak, it needs to form a larynx. If it wants to look, it has to form an eye, you know? Yeah. In order to perform functions, it has to form an organ and you can upset that. Which kind of goes back to the film where the dog mm -hmm. starts growing the legs when it needs to try to... Or the head grows legs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. When it needs to get out of there. Yeah, it makes mm -hmm. sense. There's parts of the art that I really like. It's just that, like you said, I hadn't formulated the words, but the plasticness of the characters and sometimes the action, when it got going, it kind of got really hard to follow, especially like on the submarine. Yeah. Oh God, the submarine chapter is just... I had trouble. Like, I'm kind of glad you clarified some of that in your synopsis. That should be an entire issue. Yeah. It's just a handful of pages. Yeah, I had to go back and just really look at the dialogue closely. Because, yeah, no, it's like literally they get on the sub within four pages. They blow the thing up. And yet there's still like 30 people running around on the sub who are teaming up with Mac. And they have this whole plan where we need to get to the other side of the sub. But the thing is between us and there. And even when they get there, Childs is just like, no, it's done. It's over. I'm blowing the thing up. Mm -hmm. I like that the main plot of the thing is that if it can't get off the Arctic, it wants to find somewhere that it can just freeze again for a while. And they don't want it to do that. So what they ultimately end up doing is locking it into a sub that will freeze on the bottom of the ocean that you know a government is going to come and investigate. Yeah. It just doesn't even make sense why the heroes would let that happen. I mean, if they set off like a nuclear warhead or something, that would be cool. Right, right. There's a cool story in there. It just felt like, oh, we have to end it. And so then it ends. It's pretty much Mac on the ice. And yeah, it's floating in the ocean instead of being near a destroyed base, but it's still the same effect. And then there's no real satisfying aspect to the conclusion. And what really frustrates me is, okay, the hull of the sub ruptures on the bottom of the ocean... And Mac just harmlessly floats up to the surface and is still alive. Right. Not only would you have probably been crushed by the water pouring in, but just the depressurizing. Mm hmm You would have had a brain embolism just floating up. No, it's a cheap... <laughs> See, and that could have been like an interesting idea. Like, maybe this is the thing and it's taken Mac's form. Yeah. But they didn't give you an indication of that. In fact, there's every indication that he's not because he's talking about how he needs to take a rest now or something at the end. Which is not something I think an alien would say. It's something that Mac would say. Well, I could think the thing would do that when it's finally wanting to freeze again. Like, think of a bedtime story. <laughs> curl up with some cocoa. <clears throat> but yeah, it's all the pieces could be there. I would love to put some of the art on my wall. Yeah. I mean, like, it's a stupid story thing, but the thing that runs away from camp and they chase it to an ice cave where they go and they face it in the ice cave and it's suddenly a giant monstrous form that they then just throw a grenade at. From a story perspective, that's just really stupid and poorly thought out. But just the image of Childs hanging from a rope as this giant blood red tentacled monster is roaring at him, you know, is a great image. Yeah, a lot of the art is really invocative. It's just the fact mm -hmm. that it doesn't ever, like, the story itself is just too cluttered. And then I think the artist's natural layout sensibilities is sometimes a little too cluttered itself as well. And so yeah. together, it, certain scenes like the submarine scene, I have no idea what's going on. And I mean, I, I know enough to kind of follow along, but I'm not keeping track of the story. I mean, I would love to see Higgins work on a stronger script. But even then, if you did a script that was more character driven and more character based, does he put enough work into the human characters for that to have worked? And also, this is just a kind of personal pet peeve, but painted art with standard word balloons, it looks weird to me. Like, I have the same problem with Alex Ross sometimes. You look at it and you go, oh, it's so pretty. And then you get this, like, big white balloon. It's so smooth. It's so sharp. Yeah. And one of the problems with the writing is that sometimes he can be really wordy. Yeah. Especially when he's got a character who has to basically narrate things to himself. And things that they could have easily just cut down where five words could do, he starts saying, like, oh, I only have 100 gallons of gas. I better hope that I can do this to stabilize and then I can land. I'm like, you could have just said, 
crap, low fuel or something like that. And that would have sufficed. And so you get these big wordy things on this really pretty art. It doesn't look right to me. It's just maybe I've just screwed up too much with penciled art or modern computer art that the painted stuff, it looks a little off to me. It doesn't bother me as much with painted art, but I remember being really thrown off whenever I look at the things from the 60s or 70s where they would take actual photographs like the old photo novels Mm. and post captions over those. It just looks so glued on. Yeah. I don't have as much of a problem with that, especially when it's something that like this painting is just smooth and very simple in terms of its colors and everything. Alex Ross, I have had that problem with. And I will say like the sound effects are really well done. Like the sound of the blood, it kind of trails almost like smoke, but Mm. going down, you get this, you know, sound effect that fits the art really well. I don't know why, but the word balloons just kind of throw me off. Anything else you want to add about the First Thing series? No, I think we've covered it. There's not much there to talk about. Yeah. And the thing is, it's a pretty straightforward story, which is kind of nice in some ways, but it also means that it's all there. It's kind of just, if it sounds interesting to you, like the next chapter of what happens after the events of the thing, it could be worth looking at, but it's really upfront and straightforward. It's really not anything to recommend about it. And I will say that even though I said that I've read and I've enjoyed a lot of the Dark Horse tie-ins, that is kind of the double-edged sword of it's cool that they structure their tie-ins as like film sequel miniseries, but you're then running into the same problem you have whenever you have a long-running franchise with a lot of films. And you like you could compare this to like Hellraiser, where it's like you have a couple of really good ones in there, and then a lot are just generic and just kind of rehashing the formula. Mm-hmm. That is something that you run into with the Dark Horse ones. You know, a lot of the aliens are kind of a generic alien story. This is kind of just a generic thing, not you know, something that a knockoff of the original thing would not be that different from the sequel to the thing. A lot of their Alien sequels are no better than a lot of the knockoff Alien films that came in the wake of Alien. Yeah. Predator runs into I think they were more successful at their like little one shots, where it's like, let's just do like a quick little punch story, more imaginative, try to do something a little bolder. But I mean, like, even their Predator stories were just like, okay, we're just going to jump around to a different point in time and a Predator appears. <laughs> we're going to do the Vikings are heading towards new lands and a Predator shows up. You know, Sherlock Holmes is on a case and a Predator shows up. And then it just kind of descends into a generic one person against the Predator. That's a lot of what I remember of 90s Dark Horse was so-and-so meets the Predator or fights aliens or Tomb Raider versus Predator. I don't know if that's a real one or not. They did Batman versus Predator, Superman versus Aliens, Batman and Superman versus Aliens, Witchblade in the Darkness versus Aliens. Yeah, yeah. I think they were the ones who did Robocop versus Terminator, where they actually brought in Frank Miller and he wrote this whole time travel story about how the Robocop program is what led to Skynet. Interesting. But I think that was like the peak of like the good stuff. Again, that's why I like tie-in media because you're always going to still find gems in there too. There there are good alien stories and good predator stories. Like I know Mike Mignola did a great alien story Mm -hmm. where it's just about a priest trapped on a planet with aliens dealing with his faith while knowing he's going to die. That sounds like a great story. Oh, and it's a good striking like 40 page one shot. But anyways, yeah, I ultimately, I, I don't recommend this comic either. So you're ready to move on to the next one? Let's do it. All right. So less than a year after the first series, Thing from Another World returned with another four-issue miniseries, this time titled Climate of Fear, which ran from July to December of 1992. Now, the script this time was by John Arcudi, who was born in Italy. He made his comics debut with some anthology stories at Eternity and Epic, and then became a prominent writer of tie-ins at Dark Horse with stories for Aliens, Predator, Robocop, and Terminator. And at Dark Horse, he was also the co-creator of the 90s revamp of The Mask, as well as Barb Wire. And that led to a long-running relationship with artist Doug Mankey. And since then, Arcudi's written for Martian Manhunter, Gen 13, Excalibur, Batman Black and White, Aquaman, Doom Patrol. And he returned to Dark Horse, where he spent 11 years as Mike Mignola's co-writer on BPRD and its various spin-off books. So is Arcudi's work something that you're familiar with at all? I looked through his list of credits. I'm sure there's some stuff I've read. Nothing that's really stood out. I've not read the BPRD stuff, which is probably one of his more famous things. Yeah. Nor have I read the original Mask. Well, not the original Mask, but his version of the Mask, I guess, is the best way to phrase it. Yeah, I've read the first of those, but I never read the entire series. And that was a long time ago. I always wanted to check out his one DC series, Major Bummer. Yeah. It looked like something that would have been right up my alley, which is basically a slacker gets superhero powers, but decides that he doesn't want to use it for anything more than to like steal cable instead of cure cancer or that sort of thing. 
<laughs> it sounded really fun. It only lasted, I think, 15 issues, and it's one I hope to check out at some point. Yeah, and I've also never read that BBRD run. I know I read the first few, like three or four volumes of Hellboy, but I have yet to read anything beyond those. I need to. That's one I keep meaning to read. I'm the same way. And I'm sure I've read some of his Alien and Predator comics, but a lot of those I read in the 90s, and I don't remember which ones I've read and which ones I haven't. Yeah, I've probably read like the Excalibur thing that you mentioned and some of the other stuff, but it's nothing that stood out to me. And then the artist, Jim Somerville, he is like a complete enigma to me. You mean the creator of The Walking Dead? Different Walking Dead. Or The Walking Dead book? Yeah, like, are you familiar with Air Cell comics at all? No, I'm not. Yeah, back in the 80s, they were kind of like a Hot Topic comic, where it's like lots of zombies and moody dark elves and vampires, you know, with guns and like the Underworld movies, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) They were just kind of like silly, juvenile, trying to be edgy and cool comics in the late 80s. And he did a bunch... Bunch for them like Maelstrom, Mummy's Curse, The Walking Dead, Elf Lord, Stark Future, Kikusan, Warlock 5, and then Air Cell merged into Eternity, which merged into Malibu, which everyone knows the Malibu story. Mm-hmm. At Dark Horse, he did a couple of tie ins, but beyond 1994, when he did a Predator issue and a single backup story in The Pit. He has not done any other work. He's just kind of disappeared. I know no biographical history about him. I know nothing about him. Well, we'll we'll get to it, but there might be a reason for that. We might disagree on that reason, but yeah. Okay. And then the anchor, Brian Garvey, who did the first issue, he was a hugely prominent anchor throughout the 80s and early 90s. Him and Ian Aiken were partners and did a lot of stuff together. They did a huge run on ROM, Transformers, Iron Man. Garvey actually quit comics sometime in the early 90s and became an animator at DreamWorks. Oh, wow. And worked on like Prince of Egypt and Road to El Dorado, Spirit. And he's since reunited with Ian Aiken and they run a commercial illustration studio. And then issues two through four are inked by Robert Jones. But he's another guy who I can't really find much info on. He's done a few runs throughout the 90s on Stormwatch, The Ray, Punisher, and Alan Moore's Glory. He mostly seems to be one of those guys who would just do like a single issue of a bunch of different books. He was kind of like a fill-in inker whenever they needed someone. Early 2000s, his credits just completely drop off, and I know nothing about him since. So it's a bunch of people that we don't know who did stuff, but some of them don't do much anymore. At least I know Brian Garvey's a good inker, because I just read the entirety of ROM and Transformers. Some good work in there. Yeah, I've read some of ROM, and it holds up. Beginning to end, that is one of the best runs I've read. Anyways, the synopsis for this one's going to be a little longer, so let's try to get through it. Power through. Right after the last story ended, Mac is fished off the iceberg by a group of Argentinians. As the main group heads back to base, one sees an injured seal and falls victim to the thing. Mac comes to in another hospital room on a joint military medical base led by the cranky Sergeant Acapito and Dr. Sabia Viale. Mac freaks out and dies out a window, discovering the base is in the middle of a rainforest on a peninsula in Argentina. As Viale tells him the change in climate was necessary due to his extreme frostbite, Mac goes on about how they're doomed before Agapito has him locked in quarters. Over a meal, the scientists and soldiers on the base argue over the potential reality of the thing, with several having witnessed the outbreak of the last series. Other characters are introduced, including misogynistic asshole Dr. Desiato. In his room, Mac won't stop eyeing a pen full of sheep. Getting the drop on Agapito, Mac grabs an assault rifle, rushes out, and starts gunning the sheep down. Everyone's shocked, especially when Agapito takes Mac out with a trank dart, but as they head back to their quarters, a soldier goes through the animal carcasses to see what usable meat is left, and as he pets one surviving sheep, the wool suddenly leaps up and a thing creature emerges, absorbing him, another soldier, and most of the dead sheep. Again alerted, Agapito and his soldiers start emptying their guns into it, but there's no effect as the thing starts dividing in two. The scientists chip in, tossing gasoline on the creature and setting it aflame. As everyone takes the horror in, they realize one of them must have been infected while still in Antarctica. In issue two, Agapito is laden down with guns and a flamethrower as everyone sits around a campfire unable to trust one another as a doped up Mac mutters about how they're all going to die. Because Mac is helpful. (laughs) Viali wants to perform the test, but nobody trusts anyone else enough to believe that it won't be sabotaged somehow. Tensions especially arise between Agapito and Desiato as the prick doctor keeps towing lines and tossing insults up to a point where Agapito decks him with a rifle butt. Desiato grabs a gun and takes aim, but he's mowed down by another soldier. Everyone feels miserable about the turn of events, even as they blame the dead Desiato, and Agapito has his men bury the doctor as everyone retreats into the buildings. However, Desiato rises from the grave as a thing zombie and starts absorbing guards. (laughs) Yes, the thing as a shambling corpse. 
After a rough night of sleep, Viali hears muffled sounds and finds Agapito bound and gagged on the floor, apparently left there by a missing Mac who also made off with the flamethrower. On top of that, the Radio Shack is currently burning to the ground. Because Mac is helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gathers together to search the facility, ultimately extending to the old nearby abandoned airfield. Following the sounds of clanging from a hangar, they find a giant thing assembling a new ship. It attacks, but Mac appears and opens up with a flamethrower. A smaller thing bursts out of the corpse of the larger one, and Mac chases it into the woods. Before he can catch it, it's torched by an American SEAL team, led by Colonel Sim and a familiar face, Childs. Mac is shocked but not surprised when he and the other Argentinians are taken prisoner and forced to take the blood test. As Mac drains some more and Childs holds it over a flame, Mac is shocked to see his infected blood shriek and leap away. In issue 3, everyone is about to torch Mac when he remembers Colonel Cruz was the man who buried Desiato and opens up the torch on him. Desiato erupts into a thing and even a head crab which is pursued outside, and Mac escapes in the confusion. Desperately evading pursuing soldiers in the woods, he questions whether or not he really is the thing, and cutting open his knuckles decides to test his blood himself. Back at the camp, the Americans have cleared most of the Argentinians with blood tests, but one thing melts into a puddle and tries to slip away before it's torched. Even though the rest are cleared, Viali starts questioning why Childs is so dogged in his pursuit of Mac and burning down as many buildings as he has, and Agapito is becoming increasingly paranoid that they're being locked in quarters and kept away from arms. Pulling a machete and slipping out, he tries to get Viali to escape with him, but she's uncertain. As she passes a patch of woods, McCready emerges and they have a tense standoff, uncertain as to who's what. He says he passed his own test and is about to repeat it for her, but then Childs arrives. He admits he figured out how to fake the test to show both negatives and positives because, that's right, Childs is a thing. Issue 4 opens with a thing Childs running wildly about emptying two flamethrowers at anything it can as it chases Mac and Viali. They make it to the American soldiers who gape at the sight, but torch Childs to ash. Back at the base, Agapito sneaks into a bunk to win over the support of Ramon, one of his men, but as they clasp hands, Ramon grins and his mutating hand starts absorbing that of Agapito. In a split-second decision, Agapito uses the machete to lop off his own arm, and, seeing that all of the remaining base personnel have also become things, he dives out a window and runs. They don't care, they've already won. Back in the woods, Mac explains things to the Americans, but they suddenly see one of the Argentinian doctors running at them. They torch him, but it turns out he was a suicide bomber thing packed with dynamite, and he takes the soldiers out with him. As Mac and Viali bolt, they don't notice the dying Colonel Sim radio the aircraft carrier offshore. Mac and Viali make it to the airstrip hangar, where they see the staff of things has completed construction of a new ship. Reuniting with a one-armed and half-crazed Agapito, they line the hangar with gasoline and start a fire, baking everything within and igniting a tank of jet fuel. However, the explosion is followed by a massive thing erupting from the ground and chasing after Mac. That's when the Jets show up and drop Napalm on the bastard, leaving Mac, Viali, and Agapito alive and waiting for someone else to come to their rescue. While I take a breath and a sip of water, JD, do you recommend The Thing, Climate of Fear? No, but there are parts of it I like better than the last story. I think it does a much better job with character, and I think it does a much better job telling a story that seemed to have a point even if the point was, this was the aliens to the original's alien. Mm. This is like the more action-heavy consequences and stakes are a lot higher story. One of the things I was kind of bummed out that we didn't discuss in Thing from Another World was that Childs being brought back and then just being okay seemed kind of anticlimactic. Yeah. It seemed like having both Mac and Childs be uninfected seemed like kind of a waste. Other than we like those characters, and so therefore we're invested to see them carry on through. This one, having Childs come back and be a thing, actually legitimately surprised me for a franchise book like this. I really figured that he was safe. There are things I really like. I just, A, the art doesn't work for me. And B, the story, there's just not enough there other than just being a bigger version of... It's a sequel. Yeah. And there's also <laughs> a lot of logical inconsistencies. Like, the fact is that they're in a completely grassed area with wildlife, you know, and it looks like the jungles. It should be game over. The world yeah. is now doomed and nothing they do here will matter. It won't be that way, I'm sure. I don't know if this story continues in the next two stories that we have or not. I don't think that'll continue, but there should be huge major consequences to this, and it's never really touched upon other than them kind of talking about, well, doesn't seem like it infects plants or otherwise we'd all be dead, so... Okay, what about all the bugs and squirrels. birds and squirrels and all that? So, yeah, there's just too many logical inconsistencies to really let me recommend it. 
but I like it more than the last one. Yeah, and I actually do recommend it, but I mean, it's not without problems, but I actually found it more entertaining. I found it more striking. I found it more fleshed out. Mm -hmm. The characters I thought were much stronger. The plot held together better. But yeah, I will admit there's two big problems that I have with the story. The first one is the setup makes no sense. It's kind of like the setup of Alien 3. It's kind of like you just got to go with it or else you're not going to get in the movie. Mm -hmm. There's zero reason why the thing... Okay, it, it only does flesh things. It doesn't do plant matter. But again, yeah, animals. There's animals all over that those woods. It shouldn't even be hanging around the compound. It should be, okay, I'm going to go turn into a hundred squirrels and we're going to run in every different direction. Right. Because I looked up the location that this is. This is a peninsula that's attached to the mainland and off that peninsula is an island. Why not set this story on the island? Why set it on the peninsula? Why not set this somewhere that's still encased? Where, yeah, we can then explore the thing dealing with woods full of life, but it's still slightly isolated. I think the only reason they used Argentinio is most likely because that was where the last group was from. And it made sense from a story perspective to have them. And I do kind of appreciate the fact that the doctor had seen what had happened in the events of the last story. And that some had and some hadn't. So some believe and some don't. Right. And they're like really eager to like leave it's all over with at least. But it still kind of allows for you don't have to sit there and convince people. And at this point, if you're reading the second thing comic, you're probably already know what's going on. You don't need to have to go over it every single time. Yeah. And then that's one thing we didn't mention is that both of these comics were published with a text page that is like a recap of everything that's happened starting with the movie. Mm -hmm. So you could jump into it if you wanted to, but I imagine that probably the biggest fan base for this is probably going to be hardcore thing fans. Oh yeah. Anytime you get an expanded franchise, it's always like, who enjoyed this and wants more? Mm -hmm. I would never try to sell someone on the thing by having them read the tie-in comics first. <laughs> no, no. But one of the other big problems I have is that they relied on the, if you touch it, you'll become infected a lot. But they were on a boat from the Arctic to Argentina, and this thing never managed to infect everybody else on that ship until Max awake. Not even until Max awake. It infected a sheep, and as far as I can tell. Well, one thing that I like is that they never do answer who was infected in the beginning. No. And I kind of like that because it doesn't really matter because by the time you're starting to raise the question, it's already spread widely enough that that's not really a problem. And in fact, we'll notice that when they're having dinner there and one of the guy is like, man, you guys weren't there, but I saw it. This thing is real. He's the one who melts later on into a puddle. So was he a thing the entire time? Was he infected later on? I don't know. Yeah. They play very loose with who gets infected when, but I like that because that's what the movie does too. The movie, we don't know who and when people got infected half the time. That's true. So I kind of like that. I just think part of the problem with that is that while this does develop the characters better than the first miniseries does, they still aren't that interesting or developed outside of a few. Basically, the only ones I had any real connection with was Mac, Childs, obviously, and then Dr. Viale and Sergeant Agapito. 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 Agapito, I think, is probably the most developed character of the entire bunch. Yeah. And actually, I really enjoyed his character because he kind of reminded me, like, he's a South American Bruce Campbell type figure where he gets <laughs> beat up a lot. And I love that he's a character who's he's so high strung and so pissed off all the time that I kept expecting him to take a turn where he would, like, suddenly become, like, a bad guy where he's so obsessed with taking this thing down that he'll start taking everyone else down, too. Well, yeah, because he's kind of that typical macho guy. He looks like the guy who's just going to try to show up the main hero. Especially when he's all feverish and has lost an arm. <laughs> right. You know, you think like, oh, he shot Mac in the back. And then it's like, no, I used tranquilizers. What do you think? And Yeah. And I love, though, that he always does kind of do the right thing, even up to the very end. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that he makes it through. One of my favorite panels in the entire thing is, well, it's going to be a long wait. I guess now you have some time to look at Agapito's arm. And it's just him just sitting there hunched and still looking all intense. <laughs> yeah, I have thoughts on the ending, but we'll probably get to that later. But yeah, I loved his character. Dr. Viale, she was at least a person who actually you kind of cared about. Yeah. She didn't really have much of a personality. I just don't think she really got to do much. Yeah, she's just generic female character, which was one of the things that we never really had in the thing before. We had the doctor yeah. in the last story, but she, like we mentioned, disappears and never comes back. But the thing is, most of the revelations about what the thing is have already been discovered. So there's not really much there for her to uncover. I kind of get the impression she's just supposed to be a love interest for Mac because they do hint at that. I got the impression that she was treating him for frostbite. Really? Well, because I know they brought him there because of his severe frostbite. 
I got the sense that she was just a doctor taking care of him. Okay. But they do hint that, like, you clearly liked him because you spent so much time with your patient. That's where it feels like this was a screenplay. (laughs) Right, right. It kind of feels like it would have been the generic damsel in distress type character in a Hollywood movie. And then I'm thinking about, like, the other characters that they develop. You have Mark, who's the American, the kind of redheaded guy, who, again, they, like, seem to set up for something, and then they never really go anywhere with him. Yeah, I kind of lost track of him. What happened? He was just one of, we have the final issue where it's just suddenly revealed that oh yeah everyone who's a camp is already a thing yeah and then i kept expecting him to do something a little bit more i expected them to do more with that in general of just okay the entire camp is things and we have that one scene where they're all just kind of smiling and shrugging off agapito running away because they've kind of won and then they don't build on that i want more like build on the character of okay we have an entire community of things now yeah the only thing we see is that they seem to be building another ship, though this one looks more like the Blackbird than the whatever little thing Wilford Brimley was making. Yeah, and then they turn the old white-haired scientist into a suicide bomber. Yeah. I mean, there's some neat ideas. Like, I like the idea of, because this version of the thing now has numerical advantage, it can still play it safe and sacrifice bits and pieces of itself, which is kind of clever. And I like the way Childs manipulates the people with the blood and mm-hmm. making Mac doubt himself. And I think that could have been played out better. Yeah. The way it's written, I never really feel like Mac is actually infected. I don't know why. Maybe it's just the fact I've read too many stories like this where I know the hero is not going to become evil halfway through and just stay that way. Though if they had, I wouldn't mind then like passing the torch to Agapito for a story or two. Right. Or Viale or somebody yeah. else to take the reins. I like that the cliffhanger of issue two is Mac is a thing. Yeah. And then it's revealed that, oh, he's not. But then the cliffhanger of issue three, Childs is a thing. I like how they're using the cliffhangers there. And this is where they're putting a spin on. Like, I love that. Yeah, no, I know that he's not a thing either, especially as we keep following him. But I like the whole twist of Mac fails a blood test. What does that do to him psychologically? Right. As he freaks out and starts talking to a squirrel. (laughs) Yeah, I think it could have followed up on that a little bit more, but it's still fun. Like you said, the squirrel thing is really kind of entertaining and him just kind of going crazy. Oh, look at you, little guy. And he reaches out to pet him. Wait, no, you might be infected. Wait, no, I might be infected. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There's some really entertaining stuff there. And there are actual legitimate cliffhangers here as opposed to the first story where the cliffhanger is Childs is back. And that's kind of a cliffhanger because we don't know at that point if he's safe or not. At least in the first miniseries, it kind of made sense because we already know from the beginning, Childs is the one who dragged him out to shore and then went back. So we know that Childs survived the first movie. Right. But in this one, it's like, Mac already shouldn't have survived coming out of that sub. How did Childs? Yeah, that made no sense to me at all. So I immediately was suspicious of him. Well, you see, I hunkered myself into a torpedo. It wasn't easy. (laughs) How'd you get in there? Wasn't easy. Uh... Still my favorite line from Big Trouble in Little China. I agree. I agree. (laughs) But with Childs, though, one of my main problems is that the final issue I do find kind of anticlimactic because you have that big reveal of Childs and then within like the next few pages of the following issue, he's just blown up by the military and he's gone. Yeah. Like, I kind of like that you have this monstrous Childs running around crazy with flamethrowers. He's literally just emptying all their flamethrowers. And he was talking and that was something that we never really got. I mean, the thing would talk in the film, but it was always just to pass. It never would try to communicate once it was discovered. Yeah. I kind of like the idea of that. It has the upper hand, so it doesn't care. Yeah. And I like we got that in the Agapito scene where he's suddenly surrounded by all these scientists who are smiling and talking to him and openly acknowledging, yeah, we're thanks. Yeah. We beat you. I like the idea. I wish they had done a little bit more to tell us a little bit more about the thing yeah. and what maybe what its goals are, even if it was just something really vague, but I still liked it. I think it was a neat little idea to add on. It wasn't just a repeat of what we saw in John Carpenter's thing. I just would have liked to build on that more of, give me at least some more scenes from the thing's point of view, because then I love that even after Agapito leaves, the thing things are talking amongst themselves. Because the thing, one of the biggest misconceptions, the thing is not a single organism. It's an organism that constantly divides into new organisms. Mm -hmm. 
they're kind of like instantly forming a community. And one thing I did like is that they kind of explained that because I kind of understood why the blood worked in the film, but the idea that it's a separate entity and so therefore it's trying to protect itself and without an actual intelligent system. Well, yeah, because it hasn't formed a brain, it hasn't formed a nervous system, it's still just in the form of blood. Right. That makes sense to me. And that was something that I don't think I ever grasped. And maybe that was always the intent of the film, but I never really grasped onto that. And I always kind of wondered why, if it was trying to pass as blood, even if it's separate from the host body of the main thing, why it would react that way. It's just reflex. And I kind of like, though, that when a thing is able to fully process and think, it might be willing to kill itself in order to let other organisms pass. Like, we have the one that packs itself full of dynamite and blows up. Mm Mm-hmm. It makes sense, because that was the thing, is that the movie does it to a degree, too, but the last book, they use the fire a lot. Like, it's become, like, the thing's kryptonite. Well, they use a lot of fire in this one, to the point where I love that Viali is just going to Childs, can you please stop burning the camp down? Right, right. (laughs) And I like the fact that the thing is able to use that as a weapon against attackers, is to say, well, if you're going to set me on fire, let's have you have some consequences for that by strapping dynamite to myself. And then also, with the anticlimactic final issue, it's just, I'm pretty perfectly fine with they find the ship they roast the hangar suddenly a big thing comes out even the dropping the napalm but then it just kind of ends it feels like the story should be going on for another page or two yeah it just kind of stops with oh we're alive they'll probably come get us you might want to just check Akapito's arm yeah i kept looking to make sure i didn't skip a page or something there should be a page with like a squirrel with like mutant eyes suddenly turns and runs into the woods or something right that was again one of my main problems i think that if you're gonna have the thing in a area that is not as isolated as the arctic you're gonna have to show the consequences of that and they really just kind of seem like well the americans came and blew it up so we're good even the original short story who goes there had a scene in the arctic where they see a couple of seagulls come in and land on the other side of a hill and they run out like we need to kill those seagulls because we need to be able to account for those seagulls and make sure that nothing gets away and one of the seagulls still gets away at the end and they never know whether or not that seagull was a thing or not And it would be nice to have like a scene that mirrors that Mm -hmm. of like, okay, we're still in woods surrounded by animals, any one of which could be a thing. Are we really going to believe that we stopped it here? It almost feels like they ran out of time or pages to be able to, and they just said, well, this is the cutoff. And maybe they figured because it's Dark Horse, maybe they figured they'd be doing more of these and they could just pick up eventually. But it seems odd to have, like you said, so many of these books are just single chapter stories, whether they're done in one issue or four. They kind of tell a complete story that kind of stands on its own. And this one just feels like it almost could have just had a text at the end saying, dun, dun done you know or the end or something like that just to kind of make you feel like there's something more is going to happen but nothing does i think that's the main problem with the thing as a whole in terms of making a franchise is they keep wanting to just stick it in an isolated location stick it in the same spot you always have to have mac be the hero i mean like what made the alien and predator comics even when they weren't at their best what made them more interesting is they would at least find a variety of settings and characters they don't have have it like every issue has to be about Ripley. What's funny is they started the comics following Newt and then Alien 3 happened and they had to suddenly go back and rewrite those for, for days. <laughs> <laughs> That's a completely new character. That's not Newt at all, though. <laughs> And like Predator, the first couple volumes followed the Arnold Schwarzenegger character's identical twin brother who's a cop in New York. Yeah. But then again, I like that they then shed that and would just be, okay, it's a new story every time with new characters in a new setting, sometimes in a different time period. Like, you could have had a Thing story where a Thing managed to lock onto, like, one of the Arctic expeditions from the 1800s. And you have people in that period setting having to deal with the Thing while on a ship heading back towards the mainland. Yeah. You could do that. That would be awesome. And that's the thing, is that I think it's best when they think creatively like that and gets outside of the sequel formula, which is kind of what these last two stories have had. Is It feels like, even though I think by this point, it, you know, it had been at least 10 years since the film. and Oh, yeah, this was nine years after the movie yeah so they knew that there was not likely going to be a sequel anytime right. soon and so they could have gone in adventurous new places and instead it just feels like this is going to be a boilerplate sequel that's the reason 
why ultimately I can't recommend it. It's, it feels like this is what a Hollywood executive, if this had been a hit and John Carpenter had been completely removed from the thing, I have a feeling this is kind of what we would have gotten as far as what the sequel would have looked like. And it wouldn't have been terrible, but it wouldn't have been nearly as memorable as the movie. And I mean, it's big shoes to fill, Yeah, but I just don't see why I should recommend this or why should people go out and seek it out? Wow, it's like you're getting to your final thoughts already. We still have things to discuss. Oh yeah, no, I didn't. I'm, I'm sorry. Let's discuss the art because that's what was one thing I really, I didn't like the art. And it's weird because I think it's perfectly good art. I think it's art that fits this story. I mean, there is a kind of grotesque quality to it, even when it's just the normal people. But I love how he does all the thing attacks, like every time a creature comes out, because there's such variety. I mean, that was kind of my problem with the first miniseries. It was just kind of like a jumbled red mass of tentacles and teeth. And this one, it's like everything is distinct and different, kind of like the movie was. True, but it's something about it. It's a little loopy and a little kind of oddly gangly. and It's a little cartoony, I think, is my problem. It has that kind of Aeon Flux look to it. That kind of Peter Chung. Like the movie, things kind of blended together. So it all looked like, yeah, there's distinct, like this is the dog head and this is a part of one of the station members. And this is like weird alien spider legs and stuff like that. And all this kind of blending together. The split head. Yeah. But the, uh, and admittedly, it's not an actual thing. It's the dream scare. But you have the seal with the long tongue. And then you've got like human arm and octopus legs and a like, crab leg. And it seems a little bit too much like somebody just drew like a mismatch of things. The thing that I enjoy the least in the movie is the big final one where it's kind of like, let's just pour everything on top of one another. They do fall on that model a little too often with this one. Mm -hmm. Like, especially with the big first sheep thing. Though I, one thing I did like is the sheep when it first reveals itself. Oh yeah, where the wool leaps up. Because that's something I wouldn't have expected. Instead of, I was expecting like, it's going to bite him or something. But suddenly it becomes like 10 feet tall and is splitting into two and it becomes too big too fast. Right. Admittedly, I think it was trying to absorb other sheep or something, yeah. but that's not shown. The only real hint of that is the fact that you see a few other sheep heads like coming out of it at the same time. Yeah. You know, again, like Desiato, we haven't really discussed Desiato as much as a character, but when he comes back as the zombie, we really only just see him shambling like a zombie, which doesn't really make sense. Then you have the melting one. What I liked about the melting one, they drew that scene out too long where he starts sloshing across the room and eating people. But I love just the idea of you're sitting next to a guy who just suddenly then becomes a puddle. Which is a different way of showing how it can change shape and attack things other than just tentacles. And I should point out that that comes actually from the original novella too, who goes there, where they have all these cows in pens and they're going through and testing the cows and suddenly they notice that one of the cows has just turned into a puddle and is trying to leak away. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) And I love that he's not even trying to attack anyone, he's just trying to slide away. (laughs) It's like, no one's going to notice that I'm a giant grinning face on a puddle. Yeah. I don't know. It just, it, after a while, it started blending in together. I mean, there's good parts to it. And I don't think all the art was bad. I don't know. It, because it's so bright and colorful, and which admittedly is kind of nice to have a different change of environment than the stark whiteness. Yeah. But I think it also just makes it look a little bit more comical to see these things. Especially the child's thing. Yeah. Fully lit and standing out in the bright, sunny day. I mean, the child's thing looked like a Looney Tunes character. Yeah. That was just weird. It kind of reminded me of, like, the Giver, like, one of the monsters from there. (laughs) Oh, God, yeah. I know which one you're talking about, too. Yeah. The Jimmy Walker one. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. And there are parts of it that really just made me laugh. Like, there's the one that grows like a big zit when it's on fire, and then it explodes. And then a hooved monkey pops out of its back. Right. That kind of made me laugh. And then you have this look on Max's face, like, I have actually never seen that, and I don't know how to respond. Just kind of like a dumbfounded look on his face. I actually kind of chuckled at that. I don't know if that was purposeful or not, but I laughed. I like, though, that they went beyond just, and tentacles appeared, that he was trying to come up with a variety. Like, I mean, especially, yeah, when something pops out of his back, we have a head crab in another scene, but in this one, it's a monkey with hooves, so it can run through the trees fast. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes sense, but it's also leaving a trail of blood and it should be infecting all the plants. Yeah. (laughs) Again, yeah, the setup is just so hard to get around. And also the ending. It just petered out. It was like all of a sudden, and the Americans come and blow it up. But I mean, like in terms of the art, I also like it because it is expressive and it's exciting. It has movement to it. It has punch to it. It's a little loopy, a little wild, a little loose. 
But I don't know. It pulled me into the story more than it took me out of it. It's weird. It's kind of like I like the action and the energy of it a little bit better than like the Higgins art from the last one. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it invokes the mood or tone and atmosphere that the first one had and the cartoony nature of it. And I don't mean that necessarily in a negative way because I think this is art that probably would have been perfectly fine in like an issue of some random comic of the 90s. But no, there is definitely a line between grotesquely disturbing and cartoony. Mm -hmm. And this definitely does cross over that in a few occasions, definitely. Like Child's. Yeah, the Child's design. I love the guy melting into the puddle, but that the puddle is basically just a giant grotesque smiley face. Right. I definitely agree with you there, but I'm still like, I I just, I love the idea of that. Mm -hmm. My recommendation of this is not that this is great, not that this is going to fully satisfy everyone. But again, it's like looking at a sequel. I would recommend Predator 2 because it's not as good as Predator, but if you like Predator, here's something more. Here's an extra dessert for you. It's not going to be as satisfying as the first, but it's more of what you liked. Right. And this one gives me enough of what I liked about the original, plus it's an improvement on the first comic. It's okay, is what I'm saying. It was one of those things where after reading through, because I actually had to read the first one in kind of chunks because I just wasn't having as much fun with it as I was hoping. And this one, I will say it was a breezy read. It was nice, quick, and there were some points where I laughed with it. Sometimes I laughed at it. It read really fast. And so I'm not going to change my recommendation, but I will say like it's something that if you want to go back to it, if it's something that where you're curious about it, you could do a lot worse. I think there's enough things to enjoy about it that if you want more the thing is worth checking out. I just think that on its own merits, it doesn't stand up well enough to really solidly recommend it. But again, I mean, like when we're talking about tie-in comics, it's like, okay, how does this spin off from the original? That makes sense. As far as like how you're approaching your recommendation, I totally understand that. I think it's also the best we're going to get. We'll see what happens next episode. <laughs> I only flip through the other two comics, but I kind of got an idea of what they're going to be about, but I really don't know how much they're going to tie into what we've seen so far or not. And how good they're going to be. Yeah. And how good they're going to be. <laughs> So I'm really kind of curious to check those out. Anyways, one final thing I definitely want to bring up is the Desiato character. Mm. I mean, they didn't do much with him, but as like the only other developed character in the cast, I like how he's a blue red herring Mm -hmm. and that he's a red herring who ultimately turns out to be the right thing. And then I love how they build up that first issue where, okay, we know there's a thing. We know one of us is the thing. They've gone loose on the camp. We just saw the as a giant creature made out of sheep. So issue two opens with everyone just sitting around a campfire, not wanting to leave anyone else out of view, not wanting to trust anyone else with a blood test. Everyone's just freaking out about the thing. And they stay there all night with, of course, Agapito huddled up with a flamethrower. Mm. And I love that it just comes down to Agapito and Desiato just get into such a fight that escalates to the point where Desiato pulls a gun and gets gunned down. It reminded me of the first movie with Clark, Mm -hmm. where someone dies just because of human conflict. Right. But then I love that it turns out Desiato actually was a thing and just wanted to get buried so he could get away from everyone. Was he always a thing or did he get infected after he was dead, but maybe some of his cells were still alive enough? It's actually a good question. That would explain why he came back as a shambling zombie. Right. And maybe it couldn't convert all of it. I honestly don't know. And that's, like you said, like the one thing that is kind of neat is that we don't get any explanations as to who infected what or when. It's just after a point, everybody, except for the three heroes at the end or the Americans who get blown up, are the only ones who are not infected. So, Or are they? Well, that's that <laughs> may, may be the next issue that when we cover. So. Yeah, yeah. But what I liked is that Desiato is the one who first picks the fight. So it could just be that like, okay, I'm sitting here surrounded by people. There's nothing I can do unless I somehow break the tension. Wasn't it that he had made some type of suggestion that... There was that, but then he also just got up to go to the bathroom. Oh, that's right. You're right. And everyone's like, where are you going? Where are you going? He's like, unlike you, I don't piss outdoors. Yes. I did like he was a character who you thought was going to be one thing and then he wasn't and then maybe he was, I don't know. But it it was a nice little twist and there's a lot of little touches like that that I think are neat ideas that I think probably could have been refined into something a lot better. But I think it's definitely not 
it's a lot more focused than the thing from another world comic. See, I definitely agree with that is I think it's more focused, it's more fleshed out than the first one, but it could have still maybe gone through one more pass Mm -hmm. just to tighten it up and flesh out a little bit, especially in that last issue where things just kind of ended. Yeah. Like Mark, they set up Mark the American and then don't really do anything with it and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then like the Ramon guy who I love that you have that scene where Agapito like clasps hands with his friend, like that scene right out of Predator. And that ends up being his undoing as the guy starts absorbing his arm. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great twist. But Ramon is a character who was never really set up earlier in the miniseries. Yeah, they established that relationship between him and Agapito. That would have been such an awesome, like, oh, crap moment. I mean, it's still an oh, crap moment, but it's a, it could have had a little extra punch. I love how they had three oh, craps very successfully piled on top of one another. Oh, crap, my arm is being absorbed by a thing. Oh, shit, he just cut his own arm off. Oh shit, I'm surrounded by things. Yeah. And I love that even the things, acknowledging that they're things, are like, whoa, I didn't expect he was going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like the things have a sense of humor. Like I said, that's one of the things I really enjoyed the most about it, seeing the things have the upper hand. In the film and in the thing from another world comic, it was always on the defense. They're just monsters scurrying away, yeah. It wants to pass long enough to get to the point where it can really do whatever its ultimate goals are, which we're not privy to, but at least it makes sense. But this is like, oh, hey, you're one guy and we've got you outnumbered. We don't really care. We're not going to hide anymore. And I even love that line where when Agapito runs off, they're just like, ah, let him go. Let him die a man. Yeah, That's just a really nice line. So, I mean, I think there is some really good skill on display in this story. It's not as good as it could be. But I think giving it to Arcudi was a definite step up from giving it to Ferrer. I think it helps a lot to have somebody who is familiar with the medium of comics. Because, Mm -hmm. like I said, I've seen some screenwriters who transition into comics. And some of them make the transition better than others. Because it is a vaguely similar skill set. But the pacing and stuff like that is very different. And you have to learn that. And sometimes I don't think everybody makes that transition as well as others. And I think having a comic pro who's been doing it for years. I think it was much easier back in the earlier days where scripts actually were broken down shot by shot. So you did have to pace things out, especially TV shows minute by minute. Mm -hmm. But screenwriters aren't used to that anymore. Screenwriters aren't used to having to block things out in detail like you kind of need to when you're going panel by panel, page by page. Right. And that's definitely something that they run into. I think that's also why a lot of comic adaptations of films don't always come out good. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I'm trying to think of any that I enjoyed, and I can't. I That's more your field than mine, man. Kevin Smith's The Bionic Man. That's a good one. Because they took an entire screenplay and gave it 12 issues. So it had room to breathe. And they did something similar with his Green Hornet script as well. I, I read that one. I haven't read that one yet, but I want to. It's not bad. I think part of that is they keep trying to like, okay, we're going to do a comic adaptation of film in 48 pages or as two issues. What I liked about the four issue miniseries format is that this miniseries does follow the structure of a screenplay. Because mm-hmm. you have your end of the first act, your midpoint reversal, where Max Blood suddenly tests positive, your end of the second act, where Trousers reveals the thing, and then you got your final act. This is how a script should be laid out. Right. I just think it could have been fleshed out and developed a little more. Mm hmm. And I think some of the dialogue is sometimes a little stiff, but it's passable. It's far from the worst thing in this comic. The comic is okay. I think I've kind of softened on it a little bit as we've been discussing it, but I still can't quite recommend it. But I enjoying this conversation. (laughs) I think it's making me a little bit softer on the comic. I enjoy talking to you too, JD. (laughs) Oh. I should also point out, I think one of the reasons I'm a little less on the art is back in the 90s when I first discovered the thing, I would draw doodles of people splitting into monsters and all that stuff. Like, I think I got into it in our thing episode was I actually had teachers who were concerned about me (laughs) because my notebooks would be full of people's like heads splitting open into maws and tentacles ripping out and all that stuff. And the way that I drew the thing and the way that I drew stuff is not that dissimilar to how they're drawn here. Okay. And even like you have that shot where the Desiato guy shoves his hands into the guy's faces. Mm -hmm. That's kind of exactly how I would detail that type of gore. To be fair, I read this comic in the early 90s. This comic specifically was an influence on how I drew those things. So I don't know. I kind of had this attachment to the art, even though I acknowledge that, yeah, outside of the action scenes and the thing monster scenes, his style can be just a little loopy and a little odd and Mm off-putting the way he draws characters. But at least I'm able to follow the action a lot better. Yes. Like we were discussing that submarine scene. Oh my God, that sub scene. (laughs) Any final thoughts you want to add to Climate of Fear? 
I will say it left me curious enough that I'm hoping they do touch upon it in at least to one of the next two stories that we're reading. At least what happened after the ending there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it would be really great if Ajapeto shows up again. I kind of suspect he won't. I don't know why. Like I said, I did kind of flip through. I didn't notice him, obviously. I want Agapito to cut the arm off a thing, graft it to his own arm, and then tame it as a pet. <laughs> so he is still in control of his thing arm and likes to give it crackers and sugar cubes. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, it wouldn't have a. Maybe if we could just figure out a way to like make it so that way it doesn't have like an actual brain, and that it doesn't take over his. Right. Yeah. He's like, I will cut you right back off, you motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> he is probably the best part of this comic, so I, I hope he shows up again. He's a big, goofy, yelly, angry guy who ultimately does the right thing. I kind of love Yeah, him. he's kind of a swerve on the normal trope of that type of character. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting because, again, I have not read these next two volumes. I've always been curious to read the third one. Just what little I've seen of it just seems so weird. Hmm. But yeah, as for these first two, it's been interesting revisiting them. Because again, I've read both of these back in the early to mid 90s. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to see that my thoughts for them are kind of exactly how they used to be. I'm really curious to check out these next two, but I'm a little disappointed that they weren't better. But it is interesting just because I do love the original Thing film. Funny trivia thing. Hmm. I kind of got into this when I did the past review of the first volume was while I actually remembered quite a bit of climate to fear pretty much as it happened my memory of the first thing from another world is that McCready is left out on the ice a submarine appears and the entire story takes place on the submarine <laughs> wow my memory was completely off. i think that would have been a much better story so i think that's a shame that it didn't happen thing on a sub i'm surprised that they didn't go there so we got two no recommends for you so far one recommend for me though it's kind of a mild one we'll see what future things turn into <laughs> I look forward to it, Noel. Well, anyways, thank you for joining me again. And where can people find you again? Find me on Twitter at JD Demott. That's J-D-D-M-O-T-T-E. -T -T -E, or you can find me on YouTube at the same address. Or search for Comics Are Awesome or from the pages. And uh, everyone, we'll be back soon with part two of The Thing in comics. Wait, not that The Thing in comics. The Thing from Another World in comics. It's clobbering time. I just got the C&D from Marvel. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have been officially shut down. The ever-loving blue-eyed tentacular shapeshifter. Blue-eyed, green-eyed, red-eyed, you know, there's a lot of eyes. I'm sure one of those eyes is blue. Yeah. Oh, now the eye has teeth. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Thank you.